Hello and welcome to the Sovereign Collective Podcast, where we bring you real raw truth for your self-empowerment. I'm your host, Sasha Calavota, and I believe that you can stand on your own two feet, but that you don't have to do it alone. I love learning from people who continually strive to raise the bar, to go against mainstream thinking, and who dare to question the general consensus. People are risking ridiculed or even risk the loss of their professional status as they bravely question the common narratives and challenge the rest of us to expand our minds and to reconsider what we think we already know. Join me in learning how to take control of your health and your mind so that you can have the energy to think more clearly and the confidence to step up and take responsibility for all aspects of your life. We promise to never censor here because I believe you are strong enough to hear the real raw truth to make up your own mind. If you like what you find here at the Sovereign Collective Podcast, then please share with your friends and family. I so appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in. And now, on to the show. Good day, everyone. Welcome to another interview of the Sovereign Collective Podcast. My name is Sasha, and I am once again interviewing the wonderful Morley Robbins, the author of Cure Your Fatigue, the creator of the Root Cause Protocol, and he educates us on everything to do with copper and how it's such a vital mineral for our metabolism, for our well-being, for so many things, everything. Like if you're deficient in this mineral, then I don't know how you can thrive. So, and me, I have such a major focus on ensuring that we get the minerals these days, the trace minerals, the magnesium, the copper, some other supportive minerals. And this is such a big piece of it because it's not very prevalent in the soil these days. So we need to do something about that. So today we're going to go into, and oh, by the way, if you have not listened to any interviews yet with Morley, then you got to go back to, they're quite actually recent numbers, 59, 60, 63, 59, Morley lays it all out for us. Why is copper so important? What's involved within the body? And then we get into more specific things about the protocol and the next interview and then other questions later on. Just really fascinating stuff. Always new nuggets to be learned from these interviews. So today we're going to be talking about aging. We're going to be talking about lymph. We're going to be talking about new pieces of information that Morley wants to share. And I have a few questions as well to begin with. So Morley, thank you again for joining me today. I know this is going to be super fun. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here and looking forward to our repartee. Oh, always it is always fun. Yes, and you always have new stuff. You're always bringing out new stuff. So I'm excited to hear what new stuff you have to share if you want to. But first, I'm going to start with a, a listener question, two of them that they had. She personally messaged me and she one of her questions is, there seems to be a rise in type 1 diabetes, which is very different than type 2. Um, and both can happen in children and in adults. And just wondering if you have any tidbits to share around that. Yeah. So uh, the two dynamics around diabetes are type one is the secretion of insulin. And type two is the sensitivity to insulin, whether the tissue can pick it up and work with it. and. It doesn't matter which side you're <clears throat> of the dynamic you're on, <clears throat> it's going to involve copper iron dysregulation. So what else is new, right? Right. And I was reading an article day before yesterday, because it was Sunday, um, that said that as we age, this is going to kind of blend our topics here, uh -huh. but as we age, we accumulate iron in our liver, our heart, and our pancreas. I'd never read that before. I, you know, I read, I knew about the liver. I knew that it went to the endocrine glands, and 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 I, I'd never had identified the pancreas in the sense of, oh, that was the, that was the endocrine gland they were talking about, because mm. then it goes to the heart, and then the, and of course to the brain. Um, what you've got with um, Type one is burned out beta cells. And the name of the cells in the pancreas are called ACINAR, A C I N A R. And when the ACINAR cells, they, they really rely on copper to do their work. It's very important to make the enzymes and to run the, the machinery of, of insulin production. But um, 
when the acinar cells don't have their copper, they become hepatocytes. Oh. And hepatocytes are liver cells. Mm -hmm. So oh. the, it's kind of wild. It's like they literally change their morphology and become hepatocytes. Which is like, okay. And they've done studies where they've restored copper status in the animals. And 60% of the hepatocytes return to their earlier function as ACE in our cells, but not 100%. I don't know why. So um, the, the, the reason for this is that iron is accumulating in the pancreas, not being recycled. It's not being regulated properly. And, you know, why does it happen to children? Well, they're, they're a byproduct of their mother's physiology. And they're basically a Xerox of mom. And, um, and we can get into the genetics of it, but the, the genes are really expressing the environment and the environment is really expressing the energetics. So it's, you know, genetics, epigenetics, energetics. Yeah. And if the if the energy of the pancreas isn't right, if the frequency of the pancreas isn't right, then it's going to affect the, the, the metabolism of that organ. And of course, with the pancreas, you've got a, a um, exocrine and an endocrine uh, functions. And it's, it's absolutely, it's a fascinating organ to study. And where does the um, tail of the pancreas bump up against? It's bumping up against the spleen nestled right in the center of the spleen. And um, I think that's significant. What's what's surrounding the head of the pancreas? The duodenum of the intestine. Why is the duodenum important? Because that's where all the minerals are absorbed. Mm. And I mean, it's just the design of the human body is fascinating. So for, for, your, um, for your gear heads, they should look at a picture of the central anatomy and the jaw is going to drop when they see how nestled the, the liver, the stomach, the pancreas, the spleen, and the, the duodenum and the, and the left kidney. Left kidney over by the spleen, it's like it's all mushed together. And if you think there's iron dysregulation in one area, do you think it might affect the right. other? Totally. And and there's an emotional side to it as well, which is, at least as I understand, the pancreas means the head of creation. Han, head, cre crea, creation. And very often, as, I'm, as I've read about it, people who have uh, issues with blood sugar, especially uh, type 1, have an issue with dear old dad. I don't, I don't yeah. know why. So, I mean, again, there's always an emotional component. And Louise Hay did wonderful work explaining all that. So um, the, the, the confusion is, oh, they'll tell you about zinc and insulin. And, and it's just, it's exhausting. And what's really building in the pancreas is iron. And what burns out the beta cells that produce the insulin is um iron is, is causing the oxidative stress to burn it out. And that's, so that's sort of the type one story. Type two is <clears throat> you're losing um, what, what precedes insulin resistance is glucose intolerance. Mm -hmm. And what precedes glucose intolerance is glucose tolerance. The, the body is supposed to be able to absorb the glucose it it doesn't it's not supposed to rely on insulin that's a backup plan that's if things aren't working right right and so the the, the people who are the most glucose intolerant people on the planet are children with Menke's disease and those are individuals who have defective copper loading in their body and they die before they're three years of age. So oh. they're basically copper deserts, and they are the most glucose intolerant people on the planet. Well, that would suggest that there's a relationship between glucose and copper, bioavailable copper, and I think there is. 
And I think it affects the function of the glute transporters, the, the, the mechanisms to let glucose in. Um, and I don't fully have it nailed down, but if if children who are missing copper are really intolerant, well, then there's a problem. And then the glucose intolerance will lead to an increased need for insulin. Now, in a very important book that I read by Robert Lustig, who's a um, um, pretty famous pediatric endocrinologist at UC San Francisco, um, he's now retired, but he wrote a book in 2013 called Fat Chance. And he was revealing what's really going on with metabolic syndrome. Um, and um, he, I can never remember his more recent book. It, it's about metabolism, but he puts a twist on it. Um, it's, it's a very clever title, but it deals with the metabolics of the human body. In any event, in 2013, he makes a comment that it takes twice as much insulin today, again, 2013, to clear the same amount of glucose as it did 30 years ago, referring back to the 1980s. Wow. Twice as much insulin. Hmm. That's, that's, that's both glucose intolerance and insulin resistance. All in one sentence. <clears throat> what happened in the 1980s? Oh, they started adding fructose to the diet, and then they introduced glyphosate. Mm -hmm. what, what do fructose and, and glyphosate do? They affect copper status. Again, the average person doesn't know this. The average practitioner doesn't know this. And so it appears mysterious and like a disease. And, and diabetes is you know are like a runaway freight train around the world. Yeah. And what is glucose? It's an oxidant. It's a very caustic substance. It's sweet, tastes great, but it's really hard on our metabolism. And who's the master antioxidant? Oh, that ceruloplasmin thingy, that protein, the blue protein in our plasma. And what's plasma? That's the seawater that the red blood cells like to swim in. Well, that, I've not seen it in writing. I found an article that I think alludes to it, but my theory, Sasha, is that we know that ceruloplasmin can neutralize both iron and oxygen to prevent oxidative stress with one enzyme called ferrooxidase, stops, stops the oxidative stress right away. I think it's involved in preventing glucose from becoming too caustic to the tissue. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> what I did find was an article recently that um, basically what they did was they, they can use, uh, what's it called? Um, there's a chemical that they can use, not streptomycin, maybe the streptomycin. In any event, there's a chemical they, they can use that causes diabetes to form in the animals. Causes diabetes have, to what, sorry? To form in the animals. Oh, okay, yeah. And then they want to see what happens if we give the animals copper. Mm. And, and the beta cells were able to recover their energy production, which was able to them and they enabling them to recover insulin production really? and secretion. Wow. So, and this was a study from like the 1990s, I think. I'd have to, I'll try to remind me, I'll send you the sure. study. Sure. But yeah. Endocrinologists don't know any of this because they're not taught about minerals in their training. So, um, we are being flooded with sugars especially fructose. Fructose is very hard on our metabolism. Um, we're being flooded with iron. We're being flooded with seed oils, which create um, oxidative stress, peroxidation. And so that's the, the oxidative stress is playing in the background of diabetes. Right. And so what we've got to do is neutralize all of that. We've got to regulate the iron. We've got to curtail the sugars. We've got to deal with the uh, peroxidation in the lipid membranes. And that's that's the domain of bioavailable copper. So. Okay. Okay. 
Hopefully that answers that question. Uh, yeah, and I'd be fascinated to see that study because there's one other they talk about, I know I've heard about black seed oil helping restore the health of the beta cells as right. well. But you don't well, hear it. Stops, it stops the oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. right. right. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So there's that diabetes question. Okay. So the second question that this same listener has is, you talk about, you know, cold hard derivatives in our supplements and the synthetic supplements and everything else. But she is just wondering whether the methylated maltese, the methylated form of things, is that something that you would think is in a different case? Like I, I am definitely of the, you know, what I love about this program is really simple thing. It's like liver has become a lot more prevalent again, because I used to be very good about that. And then I got lazy. So there's liver and then there's the minerals. Those are basically my things in some whole food seed. Like really, those are the basic things. I know there's some other things you talk about, but those are my basic. And then I like medicinal mushrooms because I, I use a lot of tonic herbs just in my foods and in the drinks that I make. But it's really right. sim sim simplified, I try to say. Right. Uh, but what about methylated versions of things? Because they're not all coal tar derivatives, right? They're not all. What about, you know, the health sort that has some real more food-based type things or methylated right. versions? Right. Yeah. I mean, there are alternatives out there. I've had, I've had people with full-blown MTHFR respond beautifully to a desiccated beef liver. Okay. And the methylation process um, is really a function of copper status. Uh, two scientists who've studied that are Jiser, J-A-I-S-E-R, and Winston, like the cigarette. Uh -huh. <laughs> and in 2008, uh, they, they published a wonderful article in Medical Hypothesis, which is mind-bendingly detailed, beautiful graphics that show exactly how copper runs the show of methylation. Oh my goodness, fascinating. And then, in, and then in 2010, uh, they, they got an article published in a more uh, stuffy scientific journal and they didn't have all their graphics and it was sort of a more toned down message, but they still spoke to the um, copper dependency issue. So again, um, the average the average person doesn't know this. The average practitioner doesn't know this. And it's just, um, it, we live in this world of deception and disinformation, and hiding facts left and right. And- um, Fascinating. I think there there are probably um, alternatives to the synthet the pure synthetics, but it's just wherever possible. I think we should try to use uh, food based, and and see how the body responds to that. And then if you need additional support, you can go that route. Right, right, fair, fair. And that's the thing: the minerals are such a key because even that example of a pancreatic cell turning into a hepatocyte is fascinating. So there's somebody I've interviewed a few times. His name is Dr. Berlando, totally wise on all these different things. And he talks about, he always says about how the minerals are really key to the form and function. So that's really interesting how you change, you take out a mineral and then you've got different form and therefore different function of, right. of the parts of the body. So that's super fascinating. So get those minerals. And it's, and it's probably to that point, um, the hepatocyte, the classic hepatocyte is dealing with iron. Right. And when the ACE in our cell starts to fill up with iron, the frequency of that tissue changes. Mm, yeah. And it takes on the structure and function of a hepatocyte, which right. it's, it's fascinating to think about. Absolutely it is. Absolutely. Okay. And I have one last question around somebody that I know who is since starting this, the bringing in the copper, bringing a bit more boron, I think she's not, she didn't think she, anything. She's had some stomach upset and digestive upset. Do you have any, any tips for that? If somebody's experiencing that? Um, and what, is she working with boron or not? Well, I definitely, well, I definitely recommend the boron for sure, because I'm a big, fan of boron so i don't know if she's taking it in regularly or not but they've been mm -hmm. trying to follow follow the protocol so i don't know okay. to what extent that boron is coming in there but even okay. that's not really in your protocol i don't remember it's just in your 
your supplement or is it in the protocol? It is in the protocol. It, it is yeah. in the protocol. Okay. Yeah. Uh, definitely in the protocol. And boron, uh, it's an amazing element, as you know. Mm -hmm. What it really does is mop up oxidative stress. People think it's some catalytic marvel. No, it's just really good at mopping up oxidative stress. It, it can grab um, oxygens in a, in a very special way, especially, I think, the, I think the hydroxyl radical seems to be able to, has an affinity for that. Mm. But um, people have um, stomach ups, upset. I would, the first thing I would think about is they probably have excess iron in their stomach that's being mobilized by the protocol, by the particularly the copper. Right. And um, and so that would be uh, one thing to be thinking about is maybe we need to ease off on that. On, on the, the Everybody wants to get well yesterday. Right. Maybe you have to slow that down. And maybe there needs to be more focus put on um, iron or blood donations to lower the footprint of iron. And then the other side of it is the emotional side. 100% of the people I work with who have any kind of gut dysbiosis have some emotional issue they can't stomach. Well, and that is, that would be fair and that would be applicable for sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. And there's other, um, she has circulatory stuff going on as well. So there is definitely indications of iron. What's their age? 30s, mid 30s. Okay, all right, so that's young. Yeah. But, but that does, I was just talking to a mom about her 15-year-old daughter who was born four weeks prematurely. And the mom was experiencing symptoms of preeclampsia, but not really having preeclampsia. But they induced the, the delivery four weeks early. Mm. So, so the daughter didn't get a download. Right. Get the full, didn't get the full download. Because the, the download, download of copper occurs in the last 12 weeks of the pregnancy. So she got two thirds in and then she lost the last four weeks. And it, and it doesn't, we don't know how it comes in. I would, I would assume that copper is going to come in and come up like a parabolic curve. It's going to, the last few weeks is when the, the real rush is going to be, but I don't have proof of that. But the thing is, the daughter's now 15 and she's, she had a seizure mm. following a very stressful event. And so I was walking the mom through how the body really works, not what the neurologist is telling her, but what's really going on. And she's like, she says, that makes so much sense. And so they've been adopting the parameters of the protocol. She hasn't had a seizure since, but but they're walking on eggshells. Right. right. When's the next one, right? Yeah. And she's getting to the age where she wants to drive and she wants to go to college. And right. So, you know, you can imagine the building stress in that family. And so it's just when the brain can't make enough energy to deal with the stress of the environment, it does a control alt delete. It resets, and that's what a seizure is. It's resetting. Mm. And and so it's you know the, the the brain needs to make a lot of energy. And so we're gonna begin to to um pull apart this rat's nest of confusion to explain how the minerals affect the, the or the missing minerals affect the development of something like a seizure. And it's all about energy production. And it's all about oxygen not getting activated properly. And, and when you think about some neurons having millions of mitochondria, the scale of it just is mind-boggling. So right. That's me. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, let's get on to the topic of aging. Aging and copper. How is it, how is the lack of copper aging us prematurely, aging us uncomfortably, visually? Like what's, what's, what's going on there? It's actually very simple. At least I think it's simple. Picture a seesaw. Okay. So when copper is low in the diet, iron rises in the liver first and foremost but now we find out it's oh it's the liver it's the pancreas it's the heart so this is this seesaw function if copper is missing in the diet is going to cause iron accumulation 
It's not, it's not, well, it's Tuesday, it's 73 degrees out. Maybe we'll put some iron in. It's like, it's axiomatic. And, and when did we first know this? Well, it was March of 1928 at the University of Wisconsin. And it was May of 1928 at the University of Kentucky. Wow. So that's, that's a long time ago. It's almost a century. And they've done many studies since then in the 50s, 70s, 90s. They know this is not new information. When did they figure out the genetic structure of it? 2021, Leon Gonzalez, a very enterprising scientist, figured out that they studied 13 genes in the liver. And they wanted to see a number of them focused on iron, a number of them focused on zinc, and a number of them focused on copper. And so 13 in total, they wanted to see, do any of these 13 genes change expression in the face of copper deficiency? It's a really great question to ask. And bingo bongo, only one gene increased its, its expression. And it's the gene for the ferritin light chain protein. Ferritin light chain is found principally in the liver. And what does it do? It stores iron, big time, mm. really big time. Right. And, and so now we have genetic proof that's only a few years old that that heart at all at University of Wisconsin was right and the card at all at the University of Kentucky were right. And we've known this all along, but now we have genetic proof. And so what's causing accelerated aging? Oh, it's iron. Iron causes aging and copper causes longevity. So when we're talking it causes aging, what kind of factors are we paying attention to then? Uh, enzyme function, oxidative stress, uh, corrosion of tissue, you name the parameter. Okay. Uh, the, the breakdown of, of the lip, lipid membranes, the, the, the technical term for the, uh, the proteins is the carbonylation. That's a scary word, right? <laughs> it's, it's the oxidation of the proteins. And oh, by the way, the DNA gets tweaked. Well, th those are all signs of aging. There, in fact, there's, um, it used to be nine hallmarks of aging, or, or I always forget, uh, the author's name. There's certain authors I just can't remember. It's, it's Ortiz something, but uh, Olmarks. Uh, Lopez Otan. Lopez hyphen O T I N. Um, okay. 20, 2012. 2013, excuse me, 2013, nine hallmarks of aging. They updated it a decade later, 2023, 12 hallmarks of aging. Oh, okay. And what, okay. Dr., doc, what Dr. Lopez Altent does not do is work with minerals. He works with telomeres and mitochondrial DNA and all these different enzymes. But, and what he's trying to do is create this, this mirage of, oh, it's all of these 12 factors and what's playing behind all of those 12 factors? Iron. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why is iron building in the tissue? Because there's not enough copper. Right. Right? And that's too simple. Oh, come on. Come on. It's got to be more complicated than that. And one of my favorite companies up in uh, Seattle, Washington, is called Reverse Skin Aging. Right. Yeah. And what do they sell? Copper cream. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a yes. copper peptide. And so um, Lauren Pickert, who is a famous, is still living, he's in his 80s, uh, he, he's a guy who discovered a GHK peptide, copper peptide. Pretty smart guy. Yeah. And um, again, it's too simple. Oh, this aging thing is really... No. And then I came across the work, you, you were asking what's new? Yes. I came across the work of a husband and wife team, Harriet and David Gershon. They were 
world-renowned gerontologist at the Israel Institute of Technology for 30 years. And what did they study? They studied the aging of the red blood cell. Ooh. They, they studied um, five enzymes in the red blood cell. How many of them have a relationship with copper? Five. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Did they tell the reader that? No. Got to keep the illusion alive. It's mysterious why these enzymes aren't working. Right. And so that's what we're up against is your more cynical, skeptical followers saying, well, show it to me in black and white so I can... It's not going to be in the billboards. Right. But it, if the red blood cell cannot adequately neutralize oxidative stress with superoxide dismutase, if it can't function or get the catalase to work right, if it can't get a critical enzyme that clears defective enzymes out of the way, which is copper dependent, ding, 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 then, then the exhaust of these enzymes builds in the red blood cell. And then there's a flag that goes up that says, Hey, I'm done. And what they were looking at is what is the aging process of the red blood cell? And it's supposed to live 120 days. Well, what happens if it only lives 20 days? And it was it's absolutely amazing research that nobody knows about. And um it's just this um very simple mechanism of the seesaw. Copper and iron get out of whack. And, and what are they playing with? They're playing with oxygen all the time. Always playing with oxygen. Iron is carrying it like a waiter, and copper is the chef slicing and dicing it to make energy. And how do we deal with stress? By making energy. How do we deal with oxidative stress? Got to make energy. Mm. So it's a, any oxygen that is not being turned into water, excuse me, it's not being turned into water to release the energy molecules. That's an opportunity cost. We've just lost the opportunity to make energy. Right. Because there wasn't enough bioavailable copper to activate the oxygen, to make water, to release the energy. And so how do you deal with oxidative stress? You got to make energy. And and there's only one way to make energy. You got you got to increase the ability to activate the oxygen in the mitochondria, and that's a function of copper. Goes back to the beginning of time. Goes back to the great oxygen event. People can look that up. Happened a long time ago. Happened a long time before people like Pasteur were on the scene, or, or you know, it's just it's it's insane what we've been taught to believe. Yeah. And overlook and overlook the obvious. Right. So the the aging process, you know, whether we're talking about hair loss, increased wrinkles, lack of energy, um, losing our vitality, getting shorter, all of these different it, it's all it's a spectrum disorder of enzymes that aren't doing their job to either make energy or neutralize the exhaust. And as the lack of energy builds, then the oxidative stress takes over and oxidative stress will wear you out. It, it, it just erodes your vitality. And it's, it's biological. It's not mysterious. Mm -hmm. The part that is mysterious is why are children being born with cancer? Mm -hmm. Cancer was historically a condition of the aging people in the turn of the century early 1900s it was very rare to have cancer now it's not uncommon for children to be born with cancer and what doctors um harriet and david gershon were able to prove and this is a really it's a really scary um statistic you like scary right um, <laughs> sure <laughs> I'm 71 years old. 
Okay. So I'm older than you. Are you brave enough to tell us how old you are? I'm 52, just as of a couple weeks ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's pretend you're 30. That, that, that's what I would have guessed you were. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's pretend you're 30 years old. And I'm 71. That's a fact. And so the amount of oxidative stress that my brand new red blood cells, and, I'm, and we're making them two and a half million a second. We're both making them two and a half million a second. People got to remember that every second, every wow. day. Two and a half million. It's 200 billion in the course of 24 hours. That's a lot of red blood cells. And they're supposed to last 120 days. Okay. Mine, the oxidative stress in my brand new red blood cells are equal to your red blood cells that are just about to be turned over after 120 days. Oh, wow. That is an oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm afraid is happening is if you've ever seen the movie Benjamin Buttons, yeah, children are being born old. Mm. They don't have the innate natural ability to neutralize the oxidative stress of aging, even though they're newborns. Right. Well, with that deficiency, with the mineral deficiencies, how could they possibly? And then when they're born and are they gestated in the past few years? Look at right. the the grand shit show of the world. Like you combine that, it's and yeah. So, and so we're the one of the greatest myths on the planet is that babies are born perfect. Mm. No, babies are born with whatever they can get a hold of. They'll do the best they can. But if they don't have, if the mom doesn't have the natural mineral base, the baby's right. SOL. Right. And people don't like to think about that. They like to think that we are, we are Xerox machines and we just keep turning out these kids. No, it, our, our great great grandmothers, up until our great great grandmothers, we were a Xerox of the original. Xerox of the original. Xerox of the original. Now, over the last five generations, we are a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox right. of a Xerox. And it starts to get fuzzier and fuzzier yeah. as the minerals are less and less available. Right. And Makes that's aging. Sense. Makes sense. And that's so lack of lack of minerals leads to lack of vitality. And and here's something absolutely fascinating. Um, one of my graduates brought to my attention a, a wonderful video by Paul Saladino. He's a very popular a physician who's uh, promoting the carnivore diet. Right. And has a wonderful line of products called Heart and Soil. And this particular video was about um, pregnancy comparing vegan diet to carnivore diet. Wow. And he decided to go for the jugular. And he showed pictures of the placenta of the vegan versus the um, carnivore. And it's a very powerful image. Um, I'll send you the picture, but I'll show, yes, it, show it while we're I'll show it while we're talking, because I think your listeners are going to be blown away by it. Okay. The, the dark yeah. placenta is the carnivore placenta. Yeah. The kind of light pink is the vegan placenta. And this is why this is important. You're sitting down, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> you've, you've heard of the term vitiligo. Yeah. The bleaching of the skin, right? Mm -hmm. It's not skin deep. It goes all the way to the organs. Oh, wow. And so what those two placentas are revealing is that the placenta of the carnivore is the natural color. It's a deep, dark purple. 
And in that color is vitality and vibrancy and intelligence. And in the kind of um, bleached out placenta, it doesn't have that vitality. And that is a very graphic indication of why these nutrients matter and why color matters. Color is not just our hair and our eyes and our skin. Right. That's what they want us to believe. There's a very important um, substance called melanin that's activated by a very important enzyme called tyrosinase. Tyrosinase has copper in it, two atoms of copper that activate the melanin to make all of the colors from yellow to black. It's really important, not just for our hair, skin, and eyes, it's for our organs. The spleen is supposed to be, it's supposed to look the color of an eggplant. Nah. And I had a surgeon tell me recently, Morley, I've never seen a spleen that color before. Our spleen is losing its vitality. It looks it's like interesting that. to talk to some surgeons to see what kind of, if somebody's been in the field for a long time, what they've seen in terms of the colors and appearance of the right. organs of the last 30 years, for example. That's right. fascinating. Did it change? And, yeah. and, and the colors have frequency. Of course. Right? Yes. Something that's yellow has a different frequency than something that's black. Totally. Ooh, and that frequency, juicy. that frequency defines the innate intelligence of that organ. Oh. oh, that's fascinating. That would be a really interesting thing to see what how how that has changed inside. Right. And so oh. we're we're told to eat a colorful diet. Well, what about the colorful organs inside our body? We don't think about that. We don't think about the, the copper-driven enzymes that do that. And what's one of the most prevalent used chemicals in food processing? Oh, yeah, tyrosinase inhibitors. Right. Because <laughs> they're worried about shelf life, not human life. Right. Or organ life. Yeah, definitely. No, they're not worried about that. That's for sure. So the the, the concept of aging is it's it's right here. And we don't realize it's front and center. It's a function of our minerals. It's a function of the oxygen that we breathe. It's a function of the iron that's in our system. And if and if and and there's too much sugar in our diet, and if we don't have the bioavailable copper to ensure glucose intolerance, to ensure that the iron doesn't act out, to ensure that the oxygen doesn't become an oxidant, well, then we're going to age faster. Yeah, absolutely. And so have there been many studies on epigenetics and copper, like gene expression and copper? If, if they have, I've not come across them. Well, they may exist. Um, <clears throat> there's one study that I that I can speak to. Have we we've talked about the PAM enzyme, I think. Yes. Okay. Um so in, in 2008 and 2012 at the University of Connecticut Medical Center. They did some very important research about the PAM enzyme. Had, and maybe um, just to remind people what that is, just quick, what the PAM enzyme does for hormones, right? So so PAM is 35 letters long, peptidoglycine, alpha amidating, lenooxygenase. I get a dollar every time I say that. <laughs> <laughs> but what it does, what that, what that enzyme does, is it turns on all of the signaling peptides in our body. So this just turned on. Yeah. Think of this as a signaling peptide. Think of this as insulin. Think of this as, oh, CCK. Think of this as gastrin. If it's off, there's no signal. There's no communication. But when it's turned on, come on. <laughs> then there's communication. Well, the PAM enzyme is what turns on the hormones. Right. And there's 4,700 of them. Okay. It's not three. It's not, it's not 20. It's 4,700. And it's, it's mind-numbing. 
But the thing is that the there's only one enzyme that's copper dependent that turns on those peptides. And if you're under stress, the enzyme doesn't work. So that comes back to the very beginning of the conversation, back to diabetes. Is diabetes the fact that insulin can't be made or that insulin can't be turned on? Mm. Or is, it, is the insulin insensitivity that, yeah, the insulin's there, knocking on the door, but the receptor doesn't recognize it because the receptors, because the insulin's not turned on, it only recognizes turned on insulin. Ah, oh, interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a brave new world. It's a completely different world. <laughs> and so um, in this study, these two studies at, at UConn, they took rodents, poor little rodents. In one group, they denied them copper. In the other group, they modified their genes, with the gene for the PAM enzyme, so that the expression of the PAM enzyme was identical. Lacking copper, altered gene, expression was the same. Mm. Then they did something very innovative. They fed copper to both groups. And guess what? The PAM enzyme expression was identical in both groups. Wow. Yeah. Which then begs the question, what is a gene defect? What right. is this? What is this epigenetics thing? So when you get into the bowels of genes, you have genetics, the genes themselves, the epigenetics. You know what epigenetics is revealing? Methylation patterns. Oh, well, let's go back to Geyser and Winston. What were they telling us? Oh, yeah, the copper is really important for that methylation thing. So the, the methylation synthase, the, excuse me, the methionine synthase enzyme, the very head of Methylation, that's the very start of methylation. Oh, it doesn't work without copper. It's got to have a copper battery. <laughs> Homocysteine's rising in your body? Well, that means you don't have enough copper to right. regulate. Right. It's very, very, very simple. So, so we've got this epigenetic thing. And here's what, what absolutely blew my mind. Um, Eric Geyer, very talented guy. MD, PhD from UConn. And he's now on the faculty at Harvard Medical School. He's an ophthalmologist. I'm sure he's very gifted at what he does. In his dissertation, he alludes to the fact that, well, this haploinsufficiency, that's a very long-winded way of saying gene defects. Haploinsufficiency is a sign of copper deficiency. Mm. I almost fell out of my chair when I read right. it. Yeah. Right? So then it says, like, is that true for all genes? We know it's true for MTHFR. Now we know it's true for the, the PAM enzyme. Gosh, there are a lot of gene defects out there. Oh, hemochromatosis, right? Homeostasis of iron, right? Gee, I wonder if co copper's missing in those people. You better believe it's missing. I mean, just go on and on. And it's like, yeah. wait a minute. Could it really be that simple? Could it be that straightforward? And what people don't realize is that we are 100 years into this experiment called let's pull back on copper in the environment. Let's change farming. Let's change food processing. Let's change pharmaceuticals. Right. And so, but we, we are deficient in a lot more other things, but I think relatively speaking, copper is a lot higher compared to some of the other nutrients Again. we're missing out there. Again, the reason why I have this print here yeah. is that the minerals are a hierarchy and copper's right there. If copper's off, the whole thing is going to be affected. And we've got and all these labels, all these diseases, all these syndromes, we're just labeling as it's, it's, it's a given without right. looking at behind what is missing is it it's a like in so many cases it's a deficiency it's it's ridiculous and we don't look the Merck, the Merck manual 32,000 different conditions profiled in the Merck manual that's the bible for allopathic medicine yeah it it, it, it describes 32,000 conditions and it's the equivalent of the christian bible missing the protagonist 
<laughs> There's not one mention of copper in the Merck manual. It would be like reading the Bible and there's no mention of Jesus Christ. Right. And that's what people don't realize is how skewed our education is, how skewed the training of doctors is, because they're not taught about the protagonist on planet Earth. Mm. Boom. Wow. Wow. If I had a microphone, I'd drop it right in. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so simple. So I was talking to a young woman the other day and she was in the hospital not too long ago because she was so deficient in iron. So deficient in iron that she, over the course of a few days, like they couldn't, I don't know, she obviously has no capacity to mobilize it out of the tissues. And so she was actually yeah. collapsing. So she went underwent three transfusions of iron. That's 750 milligrams of iron. That's... 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 Um, that's almost... Two and a half years worth of iron in one setting. And so what I did is, and she wanted an iron supplement. I'm like, you can't, you can't use it. You, you don't. So of course I talked about you and I talked about the protocol. We so we started with liver. Um, our copper that I recommend to people is unavailable at the moment, as is the boron. It's been back ordered for a long time again. So I'm going, I'm going to the liver, I'm going to the vitamin A, I'm going to the organs and things like that. Well, look, look into the recuperate that I developed. Yes, yes, that's and absolutely, good. we have to get, it's just that we can't, they have to order. So yes, definitely recommending your product when they can go order yeah. it online. So just since you mentioned that, let, let's tell people, let's remind people what your product is. So um, recuperate was born during that fateful uh, three-year period, 2020 through 2023 or 2022, I guess. Um, but it was uh, recognizing the, the critical need for bioavailable mm -hmm. copper. So we took desiccated beef liver, took spirulina, took some turmeric, um, added uh, copper bisglycinate. And then we've it comes in two flavors, with and without boron. And oh, most, okay. Yeah, most people have no issue with the boron. Some people, I think people who are more iron toxic that combination of the components of the recuperate plus the boron, I think it's pulling iron out. Oh, maybe too fast. Really? Maybe too oh. fast. Oh, interesting. So, so we just have people slow down the process or start with the plain version and then they can go to the, the boron version. Okay. And you have two milligrams copper in there per yep. capsule? And I've and I usually tell people start with one. See how you feel with two. You might try three. That that gets us up to six milligrams of copper, which is where our grandparents and great grandparents they were getting four to six milligrams of copper daily in their diet. And today, in the modern era, modern era, we're told that we can get by on nine tenths of one milligram, which is patently insane. And so, do I have clients that have superseded my recommendation? Yes, many. And they find they feel fantastic when they have more copper in their system. So I, I just take a very conservative route, try it, see how you feel. And um, I'm amazed at some of the stories that I'm getting back. Mm -hmm. And so um, people just need to be more curious than concerned and see how their body responds to the, um, the stimulus. Right. Okay. Fascinating. I wonder if there's any kind of, because copper is used in EMF protection. I'm wondering if you increased your status of copper in your body, if you are more robust to the effects of non-native EMFs in your environment. Have you come across that? Absolutely are. Mm -hmm. The people who are reactive to the EMFs are iron toxic. They're just a big giant antenna. That makes sense. That makes complete and utter sense. Doesn't wow. it? Yeah. And and so if you don't, what, your listeners should look up on YouTube, um, copper and magnets. And look at what magnets do in the presence of copper. They behave completely differently. Okay. So um, they, they lose their super magnetic properties. You'll see these big giant magnets coming down on a big block of copper, and it will come right yeah. just within a, a micrometer of the copper, and it will just hover there. Right. 
It's, it's absolutely fascinating to watch. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. <clears throat> but the same is true in our body. And it's all about copper, the general, regulating iron, the foot soldier, iron, the grunt. And it, it's not rocket science that generals have more stars made of brass, which is made of copper, and they run, they run the show. And that's not taught in doctor school. Yeah. And so we're, we are, <clears throat> it's like we're at a carnival and the doctor is the carnival barker working with the walnut shells and there's a pea in there somewhere and we get lost and we get confused. But what we try to do within the RCP is pick up the walnut shell to say, here's where the pea is. This is what you need to do to regulate the pea and, and enjoy your life. <clears throat> and so it's just, it's a process of discovery, but it's also a process of believing in Mother Nature. I've got a um, graduate of the RCP training. She's a classically trained MD, Mayo Clinic, no less, which is mm. one of the finest uh, centers of, of medical education on the planet. And her, her dad was a graduate of Harvard Medical School. She said it was the only thing I could do was to to trump him was to go to Mayo Clinic. Oh. <laughs> it's pretty pretty funny. But she's she's now completely changing her her life and her practice based on the principles of the RCP. And she has a great question now for her patients. She asks them, if we knew all of the components and the nutrients that would enable your body to heal itself. Do you believe your body can do that? And she finds that 99 out of 100 say, yes, I believe my body can. One out of 100, she has to work extra hard on getting them to believe in the body's innate ability. And, and what are the components that she's using to heal the body? What's in the RCP? The stops and starts of the root cause protocol. So it's it's been transformational in her personal life, in the lives of her children, and now in her practice. And she's just over the moon with what it's done to oh, sure. to transform her community, her her patient community. And um, so it's really fun to see things like that happen. Absolutely, and I'm sure she's getting far better results than well, she's getting better results. But she's, also, but she's sleeping at night, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And she's and she's excited, and she's she's really turned on by the by the power of the innate healer. There Absolutely. is a wisdom. There really is a wisdom inside our body. We, there is a blueprint, and and the thing is that blueprint runs on energy. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. That's the thing. Uh, so we say the body does the healing, but I say, well, if the if the body's not if the, if the the current's not flowing, then the body's not going. Like there's no, it's the body's going to do the healing, but there's got to be the minerals in there to allow for that to actually occur, right? The, a dead body that's not animated is not doing any healing. So, and what keeps us going in this electrical body? So, and, super and how do you spell current? C U C U, of course. <laughs> the, currency, the currency is very important. Hundred percent. Like you said, we're electrical beings. Yeah. Yes, we are. And, and what's really funny is when they first came out with the um, telegraph back in the 1860s, I think, um, they used iron wire. Did you know that? No. And then someone figured out that, well, actually, the pulses are three times faster in copper wire. Mm. Then they moved over to copper wire. Right, it started okay. out with iron. Oh, okay. Pretty funny. Yes. So what about copper and the lymphatic system? This is another one of my, I get these obsessions that I have to dig through. And, and lymph has always been something that I've worked with in my body and wanted and talked about a lot with people. Um, so what role would that be playing in that system? Well, what, what will slow it down is iron. It becomes like sludge. Mm -hmm. It increases its viscosity it's movement it's copper again we're you've got you've got pumping action or alleged pumping action on the blood side right although there are people like tom cowan who said that 
Oh, well, we know the heart's not a pump. We we know that. That that's that's old news. <laughs> okay. uh, but it's moving. We know it's moving. And, and yeah. the lymph needs to move. And we know that the two biggest lymphatic organs are the thymus and the spleen. Spleen's a very mysterious. We've talked about it. It's a very mysterious organ. And we, when we talk about the spleen, picture the the symbol for Mercedes Benz. Okay. The tri-pointed star. So one function of, of the spleen is digestion. For, for millennia, ancient Persian medicine, ancient Chinese medicine, I see, yeah. they studied the spleen for its digestive properties yeah. until the mid-1800s. And then it, became, it lost favor. <laughs> it turns out the spleen enlarges after a meal and shrinks as it's trying to process all the toxins in that food. So it there is pumping action in the spleen. Mm, okay. <clears throat> and the second star, second point on the wheel is the turnover of red blood cells. Back to two and a half million a second. The bulk of those two and a half million that are dying every second. Wow. That's a lot of cells that are going to be taken offline. Yeah. And they've got to be digested. And they've got to be broken apart. And we've got to get the iron over to transferrin to take it back to the bone marrow so they can be made two and a half million a second in the in the long bones. Femur, hip. You know, the pubic bones, those are where the bulk of the, of the um, bone marrow is. And where's 47% where's of copper hanging out? Oh yeah, the bone marrow of the lung bones. 47%, mm. almost half of the copper. Do you think maybe copper is important for making red blood cells? Maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Um, if the if the spleen is overwhelmed by too much iron, guess what it does? It shuts down the third star, which is called the immune system. And that's the birth of autoimmune conditions, both the innate and the um, adaptive immune functions are born out of the spleen. It's a big deal. And so if you know anyone who has lupus, you know anyone who has Lyme disease, you know anyone who has TB or pneumonia or you name it, all of those events are caused by pathogens hanging out on the excess iron that couldn't be recycled properly, that caused the immune system to go to sleep. It's, it's actually amazing. But the but the pumping action of the spleen, I think, has been completely overlooked. And, you know, we're meant to move. Movement is very important for our lymphatics. Yes. You know, you don't, you don't need to run a marathon. You just need to move. You need to have gentle movement, which is what we talk about in the RCP. Just have gentle movement throughout the day. That's a very important part of the process. And we lead, what, very sedentary lives now. We don't have the, the lymphatic movement of our ancestors because we're not working in the fields, right? We're not hunting, hunting food. We're not gathering food, right? And so, and the, and the thing, I was listening to a very interesting um, video this morning with, with Dr. Liz. It was on... Uh, uh, Huberman, I can't think of his first name. Yeah, Doctor Huberman was talking about um, aging and longevity, and and he was making an observation that our ancestors were hungry or cold or both all of the time, <laughs> and we're no longer hungry or cold. No, we're very comfortable. We're very comfortable. So our physiology has been altered. And so we've we lost that natural tension, that natural 
innate stress in our body uh, to vitalize our body. And so, you know, when you when you're eating twenty four seven, when you're in a cocoon of seventy two degrees all the time, right? It, there's a price to pay for that. Yeah, it's it is comfortable, but there's a downside. I think there's a lot of discomfort in that comfort, if you know what I mean. Like people aren't facing things; they're suppressing things. There's a mm -hmm. But their, their comfort zone is killing them, and it's it's because they don't want to put the effort in anymore, right? It's just well, think of it this way: I think our stress was physical, hunger, cold, and then now now we're comfortable. We don't have those physical stressors. We have emotional stressors, yes. and we have lots of time to worry about those emotional stressors. Yes, and lots right. of places to go talk about them online and share them with everybody, and just just. You know, it's we were we had, we had dinner with uh, three of our friends. I mean, we're all late sixties, early seventies, and we just started talking about our ailments. And it was like, I was like, listen to us. <laughs> we're a bunch of old farts. I can't believe we're doing this. <laughs> but but it happens. I've I've listened to conversations in Starbucks, and the bulk of the conversations that people have now are about their health worrying about this symptom or that ailment or this medication. And we have become hijacked by this obsession with our ill health. Yeah. Because yeah. we don't because we don't know what the nutrients and the components are for the body to take care of itself. Yeah. So it's we're true. Productive. And we're hyper focused on this physical body, but we're here for something much bigger than that. Some of us are here to help educate on that and to expose it. And but most of us aren't here to focus on, you know, no. our body composition or our the health of every organ. We're here for a much bigger purpose. And it really is taking that energy away from that. Absolutely. Because yeah. we, as you say, we're we're here for a reason. We're here to solve some piece of our existential puzzle. And if you're distracted with your ill health, you can't work right. on your puzzle. Absolutely. And you don't have the energy to do it anyways. It's, yeah, it, it's kind of like it's been created that way. Hmm. Yeah, maybe, maybe. So what about speaking of uh, metabolism, uh, body composition, that's another big focus for people. And let's just look at the average size of somebody on the beach these days compared to just a few decades ago and the stark contrast in that. So what's copper again? And I know I think we've mentioned this a little bit, but let's go into that just a little bit to where, where you where you can speak so, to that. So here's a mechanism that I just learned about a couple weeks ago. Um, Grace and Czech, 1983. That, those are the names of the scientists, Grace and Czech. Um, again, we're we're back to um, Doctor um, um, Robert Robert Lustig. We're back to Lustig. That chance, right? Okay. Too much insulin, right? We don't have enough copper to to regulate the the glucose, so we gotta we gotta have this backup plan, insulin, and just just. Parenthetically, I want people to realize I'm not a Luddite. I know what hormones are for. I know how powerful they are, but they respond to oxidative stress. It's a very different way of thinking about it. And why is the oxidative stress building? Because the minerals are all out of whack. So um, when insulin presents to a fat cell and says, hey, hey I got some I've got some more sugar for you, some triglycerides for you. Guess what happens? There's a little doorway that opens up and there's a two to three fold increase in iron uptake in that fat cell. Oh. That's a big deal. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so at a macro level, what we've got to think about is from cradle to grave, we're born with a lot of copper. And as we age, we lose that copper. It's it's in the literature, part of the aging process. Mm -hmm. Cradle to grave, we start with a little bit of iron. 
we accumulate one milligram a day, every day we're on the planet, I've got 26,000 milligrams of iron in my body. I didn't start out with that. I started out with a few hundred, like 400. But iron is building in our body. So there's a point where they, the two lines crisscross. She was around the age of 40. People noticed that their eyesight changes. That's the biggest change that people notice. Yeah. Energy production is changing in the eyes. Why is energy production? Oh, yeah, we can't metabolize the sugars and iron's building in the eye. Again, there's hundreds of articles about that. So as we're aging, we're, we're accumulating iron and we're becoming less glucose tolerant as we age. So then we're going to use more insulin, right? And so what happens as we age? We get a sweet tooth. It's, it's well chronicled. People love their, their desserts as they get older. And what's happening? It's pumping more iron into the fat cells. And what do fat cells like to do? They expand. Or, yeah. Why are they expanding? Because the iron is interacting with the estrogen. And what do iron and estrogen like to do? Grow things. So you look at someone <clears throat> who's 20 years old versus what they are at 70 years old, they're going to look different because the physiology has been altered by the mineral changes that have taken place in their body. Now, we're speaking in gross, uh, broad strokes here, but it, it's intended to help people understand what's playing in the background that never, no one's ever told me about. Why do humans in 2013 need twice as much insulin as they did in 1980? That's a really, that's a, a absolutely disruptive sentence. And most people have, have heard of Audible. Mm -hmm. Well, my Audible is Dr. Liz. She reads to me when we're driving. <laughs> and when she read that sentence, I almost had an accident. Wow. Because I was so shocked. That is. Huge. And so the, the amount of sugar in our diet is dramatically greater than it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago, certainly 100 years ago. And we're not thinking about what's the metabolic response to all that sugar. What are we going to do with all that sugar? And, the, and if the liver can't metabolize it right, it's going to get stored. Yeah. And what, what's one of the fastest growing liver diseases, or it is the fastest liver disease on the planet? Non-alcoholic fatty, fatty liver, liver disease. And what causes it? Lack of copper, lack of retinol, excess iron. There are hundreds of studies that prove that. It is not a disease. No. I just learned the other day what the exact amount of iron per gram of dry liver tissue weight is. It's like 0 0.02 uh, micrograms of iron per kilogram of dry tissue. When that threshold gets crossed, you get cirrhosis and fibrosis. It's a concentration of iron that's causing these conditions. And what's happening? The frequency of the tissue is changing. The color of the tissue is probably changing. The vitality, the intelligence, all of these components that we never think about are affected by energy production, which changes the frequency, the vibration. We don't see it. We don't feel it, but it's happening. We are, what did you say? Electrical beings. Yeah. We have, we have what? Currency, right? And so that current, is, it's vibrating electrons. They're not, they're not sitting around. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm an electron. The electrons are vibrating for heaven's sake. Yeah. And that's what we're supposed to do is help that current along. And it's bioavailable copper and all the enzymes that it regulates that allow that to happen. Right. And that's a very disruptive message in a world that's dominated by disease. It is or what they think is disease. I really look at that term completely differently now, completely yeah. differently. We just give it a label and stop right. looking. Right. 
but but the reason why the label exists is that most people don't want to assume responsibility for their health. Right. They want someone to blame. Right. I yeah. can I can still eat my Big Macs. I can still have my Hojo's or whatever. And oh, well, if I have to take medication, that's okay. Right. But I want, and I want and some, right. yeah. Some other, but it's so rewarding when you work with someone who's willing to take it on and will do what it takes. And yeah. and then there's there's breakthroughs on all levels, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, right? They, because then they 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 step into their true selves and the power that they contain. And when you're housed in this broken down body, yeah. how can you how can you shine in all that you are? But not everybody sees themselves as a spiritual being. Not everyone sees themselves as this divine the spark that's yeah. that's very either foreign or confusing or threatening or whatever but not everyone gravitates to that i i was five years old i'm like i'm here for a reason i don't know what it is and, and it took me like 55 years to figure it out but right. but i had this knowingness even as a little kid that i'm, I'm here for a reason it's like wow i don't i don't know where that came from Wow. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, nice. I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm honored to do my life's work. It's like there's there's a, a, a certain beauty and grace that comes with that. That I doesn't, I didn't plan it. I didn't say when I was 35, well, when I reach such and such an age, I'm, it's just like a ton of bricks. It's like it's yeah. time. Yeah. And boom. And, and the, what, what I was willing to do was harness myself to that call. Not everyone's willing to do that. Not everyone's willing to get up at five o'clock every morning and read for three three hours. It's like, I, I find it joyful. It's painful at times, but it is filled with joy. <laughs> that so, that would be painful for me. Yes, it would. <laughs> yeah, and it's not just it's not just the hour. It's not just the amount of time. As a, a one of my star graduates said, this stuff is really hard to read. I was like, yeah, right. welcome, to, welcome to the club. But yeah. it's also learning what I learn, and it's like, oh my goodness, <laughs> like I didn't know that. And, it, and then, it, so then the kaleidoscope changes when you learn new information, and you got to start over and start to, to reformulate what's the pattern out right. there. Do you and think one day there's going to be an update to your book? Conceivably, yes. Or there may be yet another book and, and a book after that. Right. Uh, still uh, working with the ghost, the guest writer, as I call him. Uh, he's a great guy. And we're trying to figure out what's the right tack to take. Uh, is it to come out with a, a deeper version of Cure Your Fatigue? Or is it let's tackle different conditions that people have uh, and we, just, we haven't resolved that yet right, right. And you're welcome to weigh in on that um because i'm not i'm not sure what to do I well see... it'd be interesting just to see if you found you know i think sometimes we just have to say oh wait i didn't get that quite right and and i don't know i don't know how much you found that's different right because some people stick to their dogma and they'll they'll never force well, not, no I, that's a good point i'm not afraid of uh, modifying the dogma it's there's a downside when you have a book online. Mm. Online sales are controlled by one company. We know who that is. Yes. And if you come out with a second edition, you start over. Oh. It's a new oh. it's a new book. Oh, I see. I see. And so all of that work that you did to establish your recognition, your reputation. Yeah. It's like Boom, it's gone. Oh, well, then you have to write a new book, Morley. There you go. We can't let that happen. I know. So at, that's where I think we're probably going to do something new. Right. Let the let the cure continue its journey, but come wow. out with something new. It's yeah, just great book. What, what's the focus of that? Not not try to affect the, the original. The, the, right. Fair. Yeah. So I just come out with new information. Nice. 
Nice. So guys, if you haven't gotten that book, check it out. It's it's pretty sciencey in the first part of it. And then the second part is all about the protocol, really expanding it. You could go to Morley's site. What RPG dot what no R, one RC, two RCP, 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 yes. RCP one two three dot org. Right. For people who want to know this is what the book looks like. Yes, I didn't bring it with me this time. Thank you okay. for those watching on video. It's purple for a reason, because this is mitochondria up here at the top of the page. And mitochondria are called purple bacteria. And why are they purple? Because a key component of the mitochondria is sky blue, and it attracts red light. And red and blue make purple. Mm. Very cool. Very and cool. we wouldn't be here if we didn't have purple bacteria running our show. Right. Yeah. Right. No. no. We wouldn't. Okay. So that's that's amazing. I think we I think we covered pretty much all. Oh, one quick thing is the iron sure. that's accumulating in the tissues that we're not accessing it. Where exactly? So we know it's go, it, it's getting into the organs. It's getting in now into the fat cells. We know. Is it in the muscle? Is it, or is that where it's primarily in the organs and in the fat cells? Where is that iron that needs to be mobilized and got rid of? Where is it not? Okay, except it's not in the bloodstream being transported via hemoglobin, I'm assuming. That's where you're not accessing it for energy and oxygen. It's going gonna, it's gonna to accumulate in the tissues. And so we can be generic about that or we can get specific. We, we know... Uh, it's going to accumulate in the liver. But now we find out, oh, it's going to be the pancreas and the heart as well. We know that neurodegeneration is iron accumulation in the in the brain tissue. Um, we know that, again, as we get older, a lot of people lose muscle mass. You ever wondered why they lose muscle mass? We're back to, we're back to insulin, injecting iron. What's the iron doing? It's burning up the muscle cells. They can't do their job right. So um, it gets into the bones. You've heard of osteopenia, mm -hmm. osteoporosis. That's, it's iron accumulation that's affecting enzyme function that's degrading the matrix of the bone. So the minerals are being washed away. And nobody knows that. But, the, but that that wasting, the process of wasting is the erosion of oxidative stress. That's that's the, the Grim Reaper taking their toll. And we just we don't like to think about that. Does right. that make sense? Does yeah, that make sense? absolutely it does. So yeah. Iron is, is everywhere. And depending upon your social makeup and what you tend to worry about, is where the iron's going to accumulate the most. Mm. Oh, interesting. If we if we are prone to anger, it's going to be in the liver. If we're prone to grief, it's going to be in the lungs. If we're prone to fear, it's going to be in the kidneys. Kidneys, yeah. If we're prone to worry, spleen. Spleen. Right. That's the five element theory of Chinese medicine, right there, talking about the emotions and the associated organs. If we if we're if we're struggling to communicate, it's going to be in in the tie word, the bow tie. It's going to mm -hmm. accumulate, and so it's just it's a it's just a byproduct of um, again fatigue. The word fatigue has biological significance. It's cellular energy deficiency, and as the iron builds in the in the cells and in the mitochondria, energy production goes down. When energy production goes down, then the iron accumulates even faster. Okay. Okay. It always comes down to some, like, I mean, it can be a very big, complex topic, but it really comes down to some base, simple basics. Well, it end. really is. Yeah. So the, 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 that's why uh, Christian Kershaw, the woman who really runs the RCP, um, she talks about the simplicity and the enormity. 
Of course. Right. Makes sense. And, and what I loved about the movie about Yogi Berra, the famous uh, Yankee baseball player, is he coined the word simplexity. No. <laughs> and that's, right. that's, that's copper. The simplexity of copper is fascinating as you get into it. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. So anything else? So if they can go to your website, they can go to your book. Where else do you want people to be? They can join, they can join the RCP community. Right. People are certainly welcome to take the training. It's a 16th yeah. program. Um, not for everyone, but for people who are really drawn to learn how this really works, for practitioners who really want to up their game. Um, it's a it's a very powerful uh, program that's designed over 16 weeks to educate people about how the body really works based on this mineral foundation that we've been talking about over the last uh, 90 minutes. Right, and that opens up only a few times a year, correct? Twice a year, uh, okay. February and July. So we just, we're oh. just second class is this Thursday. Um, oh, okay. For, the, okay. for group 19, and then group 20 will start in, I think, the second week in July. Okay. So we'll start, the intake for that will be starting in May. Uh, okay, good to know. Sure. Folks, if you wanna get deeper into the program, there you go. Yeah. Okay, Morley, another fascinating discussion. I know everybody's going to love it. They've been loving it so far. So thank mm -hmm. you so much for your time. And guys, share this around. Get to your copper. Let's get some basics. Let's get some basic nutrients in ourselves and understand that we are electrical beings and copper is a big key part of that. And copper is getting pulled out of the soils like crazy. So we need to pay attention to this if we want to be at our best. So please share around. Thanks for joining me and have a wonderful healthy day.